Shalom, shalom everyone. Welcome back to this channel. It is good that we can meet again to look into the word of the Lord. I often thought of a verse that the psalmist spoke about and he said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? I will take up the cup of salvation. Truth is, as I reflect on all that God is and all that he is to me, his manifold blessings that he continued to pour out, I ask the same question. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? This is one of them. This is one of the things I want to do and I love to do. And it is to just prepare myself to look into the word of the Lord and to come to share with you what the Spirit of the Lord has laid upon my heart, what He has impressed upon my heart as I do my studies and as I go through the Word. I pray, as always, that you will be blessed by what you will hear, and uh, it will actually make a great impact on your own personal life and in your walk with the Lord. That's the plan. That's the purpose. And so I'm going to ask you, as I always do, to continue sharing these um, videos with your contact and uh, continue to like the content and share it because it does help to grow the channel. And uh, subscribe if you have not yet done so, because in doing so, we are actually, I, I, I say this all the time, yes, we are shutting down the kingdom of darkness. And we're not afraid we will continue to do so all right today we're gonna be talking about um, Jesus gave spoke to his disciples and he make reference to them as salt and the light we want to be talking about that today the perpetual light right in our last teaching we looked at the access granted into the Holy of Holies into the presence of the Lord by the removing of the veil or by the tearing of the veil. And we also learned from the writings of the Apostle Paul that the veil actually represents the body of Messiah. If you didn't get a chance to listen um, to, to this video, um, it is on the channel, you can do so. And I'm sure there's a blessing in there for you. You will learn much, you know, and we, you learn much and we will never take for granted that which God has done for us. Today we'll be looking at one of the requirements that God gave to Moses for the effective functioning of the tabernacle. And we're going to consider what application, what effect, what impact this would have on us as we come into this covenantal walk of faith. And so I love to go to the um, Torah readings, I mean, they're just so powerful. There is just so much in it to learn. And we see how the scripture does connect and, you know, just appreciate um, as we read the word. So in chapter 10, verse 20 through to 21, it says, Now you shall command the children of Israel that they shall take for you clear olive oil, crushed for illumination to kindle a lamp continually in the tent of meeting outside the partition that is near the testimonial tablets Aaron and his sons shall arrange it from the evening until morning before Hashem an eternal decree for their generations from the children of Israel so we know that oil is useless without a lamp, right? And so in, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 31, um, previous chapters, yes, um, the instruction was that uh, Moses was to make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer out of its base and sharp, and make it flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Wow. You know, I, I always thought of this, just one piece of material, and it creates what is called the menorah. 
um, that serve the temple. And so we learn about the seven branch menorah to which the oil was to be poured in. So the oil that was, the instruction that was given for the oil was actually to be poured into this menorah. And the menorah was the only source of illumination within the sanctuary. It was to burn continually in the presence of the Lord. So oil was the fuel for the light. And it's the oil that actually keeps the lamp burning. Something came to mind just now, and it actually reminds us of the parable of the virgins, the, 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 the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. The, the wise virgins had their lamps and they also had extra oil, but the foolish virgins didn't have enough. And so we're going to learn the importance of having the oil and keep the, the, the lamp burning because the lamp does give light to those who are in darkness. And Jesus himself made the reference to us as light of the world, right? So the text basically describes how the oil was to be produced. It says only clear oil or the purest olive oil can be used in the menorah. The olives are hand crushed and not pressed because this oil had to be absolutely clear or pure without any kind of particles or sediment, meaning that none of the fleshy part of the olives could remain in the oil as that would make it impure. And it is said that even though such impurities could be filtered out later on, the sense of the verse as we read it is that the oil had to be absolutely clear or pure from the very start. It should not have gone through any kind of processes, yeah, to, to bring the result that was required. So the olives were placed in a mortar until the first drop of oil are extracted and the oil would drain down from these olives. The first drops of oil that's coming out is extremely pure. And that was the requirement for the oil to be used in the menorah. And so even as we look at this, you know, it's a lesson reminding us, right? Reminding at the time, the, the, the priests who were serving in the temple and us as we come into service that we have to remain pure and we should not be contaminated. We should not allow our fleshy desires the, 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 um, the sediments and the particles, you know, of the contamination of the nations or the culture, the mindset, the worldviews, and everything else that goes in opposition to the word of God, that we would not allow these things to make us impure. I think this is just a powerful reminder. The Psalmist David in Psalm 15, King David asked, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that hath, he that walketh uprightly, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. These are the kind of people who will abide in his tabernacle who shall abide in thy tabernacle. And so we see to, in the time of the temple, the people have to go through, you know, different cleansing and all that to enter, to be pure, even to enter into that holy space, because that was where the presence of the Lord dwells, right? And so we see this is really a high call to separation, but it also tells us that the call to holiness is not easy and it should not be taken for granted, right? The priests, they were, they were consecrated solely for the purpose of God's service. They were holy, they were separate and they were to basically be set apart for the service of God within the temple. In order to be holy, we need to separate ourselves from the 
the, the, the world, yeah, the people, well, let me put this right. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. It doesn't mean that we don't connect with people. It does mean that we don't have fellowship with people. It doesn't mean these things. It means, simply means that if these persons, you know, lives does not align with the word of God, then we don't have to be a part of their practice or their culture. Right? So that is the purpose for the separation because our lifestyle should really reflect the word of God. And so we see that, through our scripture, we see that with every degree of holiness, right? Um, every degree of holiness is matched with a level of separation. So each time we separate ourselves from the practices of the world, it means our lives, we are really just elevating our lives and we are getting... Um, reflecting more what holiness looks like. I, I just put it that way, right? So the more we separate ourselves from the practices of the world is the greater the level of holiness that is seen upon the people of God. Less of the flesh is the greater the light, right? So if, the, if, the, we, if, if during the processing of the, the oil, if sediments and stuff were in it, it means the light, the reflection would not have been as bright as it should be. So less of the flesh is really the greater the light. The less of the flesh in us is the greater the reflection of the fruit of the spirit in us. Right? It was the Apostle John who actually says that um, Christ, Yeshua, must increase in us or in him. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. So the, the less we think of ourselves as it relates to our walk with God, it tells us it is the more of him that is in us. When we just pull back and allow him to work upon us, our work in our lives. As we talk about, you know, the, the, the oil, the requirement for the oil and the service, you know, to maintain the oil burning in the temple, it kind of reminds me also of um, 1 Samuel chapter 3, Eli, right? It says, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, he was lying down in, the, in his usual place in the temple, and the lamp of God had gone the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And we see that the text pointed out that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And I think this is just a powerful connection here as we look at the value of scripture. As we look at the value of scripture, Eli was a priest, right? And he was getting old and it would appear as if, well, he wasn't paying instruction. I mean, he wasn't paying attention to the activities of the temple. And not only that, his sons were not doing their duties as prescribed in the temple. And it says, if you read in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it tells us that the, of what the sons were doing, their lifestyle, it speaks of Eli's wicked sons, their lifestyles, the trickery, and everything that they were up to, and the Lord was not pleased, right? So he says that his sons were not doing their duties in the temple, and they were bringing disgrace to the people of Israel, and the Lord was angry. And this is what the Lord says. He says, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, I will disdain. 
And so we know the full story of um, Eli and his sons and the outcome of what happened because they did not continue to follow the instruction that were given as to as it relates to the temple and the service within the temple. It says the light of the menorah was going out, right? And when light is out, darkness appears. When light is out, darkness takes place. And the word of God says that men prefer darkness more than light. And that was detrimental for Israel and for all people, for all people who choose to remain in darkness, right? Because once the presence of the Lord is not active among the people, it means that darkness is, has taken over the people. But right off the bat, we see the connection with the menorah in the temple and how it reflects the, the, the life of Messiah, who is called the light of the world, right? So the menorah was called the light of the world. And we know that Yeshua calls himself the light of the world. So when he spoke to the disciples and he tells them, I'm the light of the world, they, they, they really didn't have any problem in understanding the concept, you know of what was happening in terms of under because they would have knowledge of the, the the temple service and and the very fact that Yeshua is now fulfilling these activities in his own he came to walk as the full embodiment of the law to walk all these things in a very practical way. So in Saint Matthew chapter five, right, um, we see Jesus is teaching here. And St. Matthew chapter 5 is called um, the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes. So he says, and I want to read from verse, let me see, am I mixing up here? Hold a second. Right. From verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father that is in heaven. It tells us right away that what we do actually brings honor to God if they are called good deeds, if they are actually referred to as good deeds. He said it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men, right? In the ancient world, salt was used as a preservative. In the time of the temple, the priests actually used salt. Salt was used to preserve the meat. Remember now, a lot of sacrifices would have been offered, a lot of animal um, killing and that would be taking place. So um, salt was actually used as a preservative for the meat and the Torah or God's instruction or the law also speaks to an eternal enduring covenant that God made um, with David. And it is referred to as, as a covenant of salt, right? And so we see just as salt flavors and preserves, that's what Yeshua was saying, his disciples were to be agents of change, to preserve and to repair this broken world. We speak much about the state of the world, you know, and all, all the good things we want to see, the glory of the Lord appearing and taking over and how the body of believers should look and how um, God's chosen people, Israel, should come into, you know, to, into this walk and own Messiah and receive Messiah. All of this we anticipate and all of this we hope to happen, but all of us have a part 
to play in the process. All of us have a part to play in the process. And that's what Jesus was basically teaching them. You are the salt. You are the light. And you're here for a purpose. Fulfill your purpose. Carry out your purpose. He wanted his disciples to basically save the world by spreading the message of repentance to their generation. How were they going to do it? It was going to be done through their lifestyles. It was going to happen through their example because they know, well, they have to lead by example. And it was going to be done by the teaching of the word of God as Yeshua did. So the disciples were to follow, right? To follow suit. And in the same teaching, as I read, he says, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine uh, being in a place without light? It is bad enough to be in a building, for example, without light in the daytime. But can you imagine what it looks like to be in a building in the night without light? Because when, when it is night, it is absolutely dark. So can you imagine being locked away in a place without light in the night? So he says, you are the light of the world, right? The world as it is, is in darkness, but you are the light. You are supposed to bring forth hope to those who are in darkness. He went further. He says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Right? So when we speak of good works, right? Okay, so the city set on a hill cannot be hidden speaks of the temple in Jerusalem at the time when there was a temple, right? So this this temple high on the mount could be seen from any direction, anywhere. It was like a lighthouse guiding the people in the right direction, right? And we know what happened after, after, after a while. The light began to fade because the people, be, you know, became a little careless and a little reckless and began to do their own thing to the point that the very temple that was on the hill that was you know the light guiding people guiding the nations in the right direction actually got or actually was destruct um destroyed because of their recklessness because of their carelessness right so so now we understand the importance of this message so there is no temple in Jerusalem, but we are now the temple of the living God. And we, our, our temple must be light. Yeah? Light must exude from us so the people of the world will see us and recognize us and identify us. He referred to his disciples as the light of the world. And so first we need to consider the word disciple. Who is a disciple? It basically means um, discipleship. It basically means a life dedicated to God, a life that is uh, committed to carrying out God's purpose and his will on earth as it is in heaven. Yeshua taught his disciples to pray. And he says, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be your name. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It is one who, so we can say then that a disciple is one who come into partnership with God. A disciple is one who is standing on the side of God. A disciple is one who is coming into agreement with God's perfect will that whatever is his will is, then it becomes our will. So that is how we're going to become the light of the world. Right? With these words, he urged his disciples to go forth and to fulfill the mission, the mission of preaching the gospel 
of salvation, the message of repentance. To be so the you are to be a light to the world. So the people who don't know are in darkness. But you who are empowered with knowledge of Torah, with knowledge of the word of God, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your heart, upon your life, you are to go and do that which you are have been commissioned to do. So they were supposed to go forth and they were supposed to provide the spiritual enlightenment for the world around them and spread the kingdom message of repentance. Remember the message that Jesus shared? He says, repent, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message for us today. It was for the disciples then, and that is the very message that we are called upon to share. So it says that we are to be like a lamp. We are to be like a lamp, right? A city, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. A lamp placed under a bowl will go out for lack of oxygen. It is not sustainable, right? So um, the, in ancient, or put it centuries ago, right? The interior walls of houses had small niches in which the house owners would place an oil lamp on maybe on a wall for illumination. And from that perch, the lamp gives light to all who are in the house. So here we see he is pointing out, you know, how observe it would be for for the for the owner of the house for example to light a lamp and then to cover it down with a basket it's not gonna work because the light is gonna go out and so just as salt without he says salt without you know if you lose your flavor you are no more good for anything right so it is the same thing with the lamp under the bowl you, waste of time, useless, right? So as we look at the salt and the light, as he make reference to them to say, you are salt of the earth and you are light of the world. You are salt of the earth and you are light of the world. We see the correlation between salt and light. The disciples, right, are salt of the world and they are salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so what he's saying is to retain the saltiness, to retain your flavor, right? It's like, it is equivalent to let your light shine before men. So salt and light goes together. Losing your saltiness is like, is equivalent. It's like hiding your lamp under that bowl. So he says, if you are going to be effective in this world, you have to, you can't hide it. Your gifts, your talents, all the things that he has empowered you with, you can't hide them. He said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glory your, glorify your father who is in heaven. You see, he uses salt and light as good works and it is said the term good works is idiomatic to or for the commandments it is what you do with your hands it is what you do with your feet so yeshua told his disciples that if they keep god's commandments according to his teachings they would retain their light and they would retain their saltiness in this world men will see them right? Men will be drawn to them because of the flavor and because of the light. They will be impacting lives. They will be change agent in the world. But let me quickly say that, or let me quickly make the point that we are not saved by keeping God's instructions, but we are saved, right? To do them. We are saved to do them. We are saved by coming into faith as Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. 
It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it doesn't stop there. As we come to faith, as we come to believe, there is a lot more in it. We should be drawn in love by the love of God, right? It should be like a magnet that is pulling us, that is drawing us to do the things he calls us and the things he requires us to do. And I think that is very important because a lot of times people say, yes, we're not saved by works. And the Apostle Paul, well, just made mention of that. We are not saved by works, right? We are saved by coming to faith in the Messiah and the word is for everyone, wherever you fall, whether you be of the nations or whether you be Israel, wherever you fall, wherever we fall, we are saved by the shed blood of the lamb, but we are also called to live these out, to do them. The apostle Paul said, show me, no, it's not the apostle Paul, James says, faith without work is dead. Show me your work and I will show you my faith. Show me your work and I'll show you the faith, right? So we see how they all fit together as hand in a glove. And so what does this have for us today? What implication does this have for us today as believers in Messiah? As we come and we know that we are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. We know we are, we come into this walk. What impact does this have upon us? And I say the message as it were over 2000 years ago is the same message that is being preached today. We are called to be the people of God. We are called to be um, like light bearers. We are called to be people that is going to be, bring flavor to the world. We are called to be a kingdom of priests. We are called to be a people who's, who should be making the difference in the lives of those who don't know. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praise of him who call you out of darkness into this marvelous light. That's who we are called to be. Israel was God's, or not was, is God's chosen people. And so, okay, so somebody may say, well, I'm not Israel. But I'm saying to you today, if you are a believer, if you come to faith in Messiah, if you come to know and accept and acknowledge him as the Messiah, you are seed of Abraham and you're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. We are God's chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are called to be a holy nation. And so it, it behooves us. We, you know, this life of separation is critical, especially now. We are God's special position. And so we are called to be light bearers. We are called to, to light up the world, right? Light shines brightest in the dark. And it doesn't matter whatever situation you may be facing today that would kind of pull you back, you know, as to why you can't, you know, go light your world wherever you go with the word of God. Whatever trials you may be going through, I just want you to remember that light shines brightest even in the darkest moment. There's a world out there that is in darkness. And it is incumbent on us to do our part, to play our part. And yes, we do have it in us to go out and to impact the world. Yes, we can. That's the instruction from Yeshua. You are salt of the earth. Maintain your saltiness. You are light of the world. Maintain the light and let us together impact the kingdom of God. And you know, I say it all the time, that whatever we do, when we stand on the side of God, what are we doing? We are demolishing the kingdom of darkness. Why not join and become a part of the spirit army, a part of the spirit number? God bless you. Shalom. Until we meet again.